What's up, you beautiful bastards? Hope you're having a fantastic Friday. Welcome back to the Friday Show. For those of you that are new here, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I talk about the news, world events. And Friday, it's all about the conversation, looking at what you've been saying in the comments, responding back, and actually having that back and forth. But before we jump into that, I want to cover one of the most requested stories of the past 24 hours. I didn't end up including it in yesterday's show, and I think it's because I've become somewhat desensitized. I think the past year has just desensitized me to this, and, and I've also found that people are just kind of locked into to their places in general regarding this. And that story, if you haven't already seen it, is Donald Trump lashing out at two MSNBC hosts. And those hosts were Mika Brzezinski and Joe Scarborough. Thursday morning, Donald Trump tweeted, I heard poorly rated morning Joe speaks badly of me. Don't watch anymore. Then how come low IQ crazy Mika, along with Psycho Joe, came to Mar-a-Lago three nights in a row around New Year's Eve and insisted on joining me? She was bleeding badly from a facelift. I said no. And I think I didn't cover this because like I said, I feel like I'm desensitized. And it's not like Donald Trump ran on a campaign of of puppy dogs and lollipops. The people who voted for him, the people that wanted him in that office, either one of two things. They either, one, hated Hillary Clinton and just wanted to keep her out of the White House, or two, they wanted this kind of wrecking ball in the White House. The disruptor, the non-presidential president. I mean, maybe more people from his base would care if he said this about like a school teacher or another gold star family, but he said it about a member of the media. And a big part of Trump's base loves it when he hits the media. Granted, the way he hit the media this time had nothing to do with policy, fake news, or anything. It was just like, hey, remember your, your face getting cut and you bleed? You're dumb and he's crazy. But what's really going to happen? I mean, yes, Democrats condemned this. More Republicans than usual condemned this. But it's not like after they have their outrage moment, they're still not going to try and use him to get stuff passed. Like, what impact does Jeb Bush have? He tweeted, inappropriate, undignified, unpresidential, 22,000 retweets, 79,000 likes. But based off of how poorly we saw Jeb Bush do in the primaries, he doesn't seem to be a mouthpiece for what the Republicans want. Yeah, you've got Collins, Murkowski, and Graham speaking out against him. But in general, I feel most people are still stuck with their opinion of the man. The general defense here I've seen from Trump supporters and from the White House is when Donald Trump gets hit, he hits you back. Melania Trump's communication director is saying when Donald Trump is hit, he hits back 10 times harder. And here's the thing, a lot of people feed into that argument. There are a lot of people that see the criticisms of a Trump presidency of Donald Trump himself as a tax. But there are also reasonable people in that group that support Trump, but they say, you know, we should be able to criticize anything. Criticism is not an attack. But the moment these hosts, these journalists, these whoever, go down to Donald Trump's personal level, where it's not about politics, policy where it's not about country, where Mika responds on Twitter with this picture, Cheerios box that says made for little hands, an obvious dig at Donald Trump's hand size. It doesn't even matter if Trump was the one that said something first. Once you go into the personal attacks, name calling, anything like that, you are in Donald Trump's world. This is a nightmare on Elm Street. You're a teen that just went to sleep and Freddie has the power. You're just dabbling. This is where he lives. And that's the thing. This situation doesn't exist in a bubble. There has been back and forth. In the past, Donald Trump has called Mika crazy and very dumb, saying that while she talked to him, she had a mental breakdown. Down, saying Mika's off the wall and erotic and not very bright mess. But we also have video from MSNBC where they say things like this about the president. He, right. he looked like a thug. He looked like a goon. You look at the handshake. Uh, you look with look at look at this. Just what a thug. Donald Trump again being a schmuck. So for a lot of people, where they hold the presidency to a higher standard and say, well, it's still not right. Okay, but for a lot of the people that support Trump, they just see this as a street fight. People who feel that Trump shouldn't censor himself because of his position. Now I will say, after all of this happened, there have been updates that are very interesting to me. Mika and Joe wrote an op-ed piece for the Washington Post, and there they say, this year, top White House staff members warned that the National Enquirer was planning to publish a negative article about us. On unless we begged the president to have the story spiked. We ignored their desperate pleas. And then on TV this morning, they elaborated on that. Scarborough is saying, they said if you call the president up and you apologize for your coverage, and he will pick up the phone and basically spike the story. I had, I will just say, three people at the very top of the administration calling me. And the response was like, are you kidding me? I don't know what they have, run a story. I'm not going to do it. The calls kept coming and coming and they were like, call, you need to call. Please call, come on, Joe, just pick up the phone and call him. Mika adding, let me explain what they were threatening. They were calling my children. They were calling close friends of mine. And Scarborough added, you're talking about the National Enquirer, yeah. In response to that, the president tweeted this morning, watch low rated Morning Joe for first time in a long time. Fake news. He called me to stop a National Enquirer article. I said no, bad show. Now that is interesting for two reasons. The first reason being Joe Scarborough responded publicly, tweeting yet another lie, I have texts from your top aides and phone records. Also those records show I haven't spoken with you in many months. Why do you keep lying about things that are so easily disproven? What is wrong with you? And the other thing of note isn't the fact that it's a, a he said, she said. In Donald Trump's tweet, it appears 
is that he's saying that he has the power to make or break a story in the National Enquirer. He wrote, he called me to stop a National Enquirer article. I said no. Now that to me is sketchy. A president that would have the power to use a media source that is not connected to the White House. Having the ability to use an outside media source as essentially a weapon. Also to how the president would actually be able to do that. Trump is reportedly a longtime friend of David Pecker. Pecker is the chief executive of Enquirer's parent company. And in an interview this past week in the New Yorker, Pecker described his intense loyalty to Trump. The New Yorker also interviewed a guy by the name of Gus Wenner. Wenner reportedly helped with the sale of Us Weekly to Pecker's company. And Wenner said Pecker, quote, told me very bluntly that he had killed all sorts of stories for Trump. But Pecker denies ever telling Wenner that. Now in response to all of this, the CCO of the National Enquirer issued a statement saying, at no time did we threaten either Joe or Mika or their children in connection with our reporting on the story. And we have no knowledge of any discussions between the White House and Joe and Mika about our story. And absolutely no involvement in those discussions. But what really makes that interesting is if Joe Scarborough actually has information, he has texts, he has phone calls, and they even somewhat line up with the June 2nd timeline. That being when the National Enquirer actually ran a story about Joe and Mika, titled Joe and Mika TV Couple Sleazy Cheating Scandal. That would really heat this story up. That's where we are right now. We'll see if Scarborough releases that information soon. We'll see what updates, but uh, let's jump into the Monday show. Monday, we talked VidCon craziest, that being Anita Sarkeesian and Sargon, Rice Gum, Phase Adapt, and others getting kicked out, Christian Burns being our douchebag of the day, and Logan Paul dodging security like he's trying to get the Heisman. On Anita Sarkeesian, Gilham says, to me, Anita failed the 3D chess. Sargon knew pretty well that someone could react like that by just him being there. It's a tactic defined by Saul Alinsky and rules for radicals. Sargon read Alinsky, that's how I know this. From Wikipedia, make the enemy live up to its own book of rules. If the rule is that every letter gets a reply, send 30,000 letters. You can kill them with this because no one can possibly obey all their own rules. Sargon made Sarkeesian break her own rules. The fact that it was so easy to do is so telling. So I think this whole Anita Sargon situation, you have to think of it in two fronts. First, just think of it as life, as the moral high ground, and then secondly, location and event based. As far as the just in life thing, people are saying, well, Anita is anti-bullying. She's always been about being anti-bullying. Look at this horrible thing she said to this guy in the crowd. Whereas others argued, no, this wasn't just coming out of nowhere. This was more of a response. A response and reaction to anything Sargon had said to her in the past slash all those three rows of people showing up. I think, yes, there are people that are fighting for their guy or girl in general, but I think there are also people that are looking at the situation in a different manner. And on the location and event-based, it was just that VidCon has a set of rules, she broke them, but the net result was that she was informed she broke the rules, and then one of the founders apologized to her. And what I will say is, while I would not have made that same move, from a business point of view, I understand why they did. I feel like I'm making an educated guess to say that a majority of the people that go to VidCon probably agree with what Hank and VidCon did. Some of their beliefs might also end up leaning towards Anita, and that's kind of just where I'll leave it. Hope Walker wrote, if the guy who broke into your house and scared the fuck out of your wife showed up at the store your wife frequented and just stood there, you'd freak out and call it harassment and stalk it. You are a hypocrite. So Hope, I get the point that you're trying to make in a very douchey manner, but you're trying to make. But your argument rests on the idea that someone making videos that is that, that are critical of someone else, that Sargon is akin to a person person who broke into my home. I don't know if to try and steal something or to hurt my family where my wife and my child sleep. And then that person separately shows up to a store my wife shops in. That is, that's the same as a person who made critical videos going to a public panel. Hope, I could spend a whole video explaining the flaws in that argument. I'll just, I'll, I'll end this with a question to you, Hope. What does lead paint taste like? Adrian wrote, are we apologetic towards people whose attention span is not allowing them to read 10 pages of 14 size script now? Well, Adrian and in Logan's defense, he never actually got one of those packets. From everything I've seen, Logan was officially invited. He didn't have the time, so he declined, or he didn't respond, but then he still just showed up. But he didn't get a packet or any of the special badge stuff. So while I understand there was a part of the community that wants to just rage at him, he wasn't guilty of that. SD wrote, YouTube equals a platform that makes boys like Logan Paul rich and famous from clickbait video slash Twitter catfights and lets them influence millions of viewers with their immature behavior. Well, I will say, as far as the content is concerned, I, I, I have mixed feelings about it. I always have to watch my myself before criticizing a new kind of content that has risen. People did it with vloggers, gaming, kids channels, box openings, me talking about news. So as far as the stuff that's coming up like Logan Paul, Jake Paul, where a lot of it more and more is looking like fake, scripted, it's all planned out. If the audience that is consuming it doesn't care and it's because they're like in on it or they just like the personalities, I can't really hate on that. I mean, I've criticized Logan Paul in the past, back in the day when he or whoever was managing his account would, would just steal jokes and post them to Twitter. But he and everyone around him in that whole ecosystem, they have evolved past that. From a business standpoint to a manipulation of the YouTube system standpoint, 
there is no one doing it better than them right now. And as someone who's been on the platform for 10 years, there's part of me that will always respect that in some way. I know I'm not gonna win people over by saying that when it's hot to hate on the Paul brothers. It's a big deal right now. Then let's talk about the Tuesday show. Tuesday we got an update from Hank Green and VidCon, the EU finding Google $2.72 billion, the Miss Energy controversy, the Sex Doesn't Sell study, CNN fake news, and Donald Trump. Jeff Kiefer wrote, when it comes to news shows such as CNN and Fox, the blame is 50-50. It is on them for pushing an agenda or a narrative. It should simply be about the facts, but then it is also on us, the viewers, for still consuming. We are their ratings through viewing and not making a stand of some kind. Our actions tell them we're okay being misinformed. Well, I think in general that's the potential issue for anywhere you get news. Better ratings on TV, more views, it equals more dollars. And so when a company realizes they get better ratings, they get better views, they're getting more money because they're talking about a certain subject or they're hitting a certain subject from a certain point of view. Either aiming for the people that tend to go left or aiming for the people that tend to go right. But it's not just a mainstream problem, that's a problem you're gonna see online. I mean, everyone from the Young Turks to Louder with Crowder, even myself, wherever the fuck I line up, it could be argued that based off of views and advertising and paid subscription models or anything, if for anyone in those positions, money becomes the main thing, you could be incentivized to do more of what got you there. That's also why I probably feel pretty comfortable with my goal and where we are. When I hit people on the left, yeah, I lose some people on the left, but I gain some on the right. And yeah, when I hit people on the right, then I gain some people on the left. It's what I consider lean growth. On days where we go up like 5,000 subscribers, that's the net result. We are losing hundreds, if not low thousands sometimes. And as far as it being our fault for consuming content that that misleads us or is wrong, that's why I bring it up so much. It is, it is incredibly easy to fall into that. It's incredibly easy to see that outside thing say, hey, you're right, you get that little, mm, that satisfaction, I'm in the right, other people are dumb. That's why it's always important to check ourselves. Then let's talk about the Wednesday show. Wednesday, we talked about the backlash against Netflix, Florida man, and the death from that YouTube stunt video. On the YouTube, Couple Death Rave wrote, why wouldn't they Google, can a bullet go through a book? Better yet, take the book at a shooting range and test it first, oh my God. But most of all, don't shoot a gun at something you don't intend to kill. I don't know, yes and yes. I mean, just Google it. I Googled 50 cow desert eagle ballistic test and it is horrifying. How they thought a book was going to stop this bullet, I, ha I have no idea. I mean, I actually went to YouTube, I wrote in 50 cow desert eagle book. First video is from seven years ago. The guy shoots it and it goes through two and a half phone books. A few videos underneath it, you have a recent one. It's from Edwin Sarkeesian. He shoots through 10 phone books with this weapon. So one, if you're gonna do something incredibly stupid, Google it to see if someone's done it before and how that turned out. And two, yes, once again, never aim a gun at anything you do not actually want to die. It's Guns 101. On the Netflix backlash, we had Jolene Natalie say, I'm someone who suffers from mental illness, and while I do agree the show is very intense, Netflix is not responsible for raising your children. Sarah Marie Party wrote, Having an advisory in the trailers before the shows and before the movies is what Netflix needs to do. People have control of what they watch, but they have to be properly informed before they watch it. Jackie Davies saying, First, we complain about the media for ignoring mental illness and beg them to make it a topic of discussion. Now people are complaining that we talk about it too much. You can't win. I do not agree with those trying to tear down shows and movies about mental illness. These shows tell those with mental illness that they are not alone. And so for me, I'm still, I'm still conflicted on this topic. I mean, regarding shutting down shows because of the topics they cover, no. No, no, no. I think if something's trying to shine a light on a situation, start a discussion, great. The idea of trying to shut those things down, no, I'm not supporting that. But specifically on the warnings, that's where I'm so conflicted. Because there's part of my brain that says, okay, because if, if I was, if I was say like, a, let's say a rape victim, if I'm watching a show and then seemingly out of left field, there is a, there is a graphic rape scene. If I was that person, I might not want that thrust upon me. But then the other side of my brain says, well, there's so many horrible things in so many movies. Does every war movie need a trigger warning? If something happens to a kid, is there a trigger warning? Is it where? Where, where, where is the line? For a lot of things, is that covered by like the PG-13 R rating system? I don't know, I mean, seeing people kind of debate this topic, it, it made me kind of see this from a different person's point of view. I mean, when I think of trigger warning, I think of something that uh, that I would make fun of. You think of the Tumblrina who like would see someone blogging about their dad and they'd be like, trigger warning, my dad left when I was eight, thanks a lot. Oh, you're talking about how you were bullied in high school? Trigger warning. And the whole situation is still something I'm trying to, to process to see where I stand now. This makes me think of like the cost versus reward. Is, is 15 seconds of this warning before something. And seeing this thing that was meant to talk about extreme situations being used on what I personally saw as mild things made it unrelatable to me. For me, it turned into another example of people using extreme language in non-extreme situations. It's like when you see people that are like, oh, that person's a bad person, and they're like, they're Hitler. And you look at who they're calling Hitler, and you're like, that's, that's the bar now. So it's that kind of mindset. If everyone's Hitler, no one's Hitler. If everything's triggering, nothing's triggering. That's where my head had been for a long time. See, this is why I say what we do, it's so 
much more than a show because it, it, it's not even just to challenge you, it's to challenge me. Also on the same topic, Damien Spence wrote, for the people saying it's just a show, stop. Young people are suggestible, extremely suggestible. For a series, 13 Reasons Why, that shows a girl getting everything she wanted from her death, a young person might think this is a good way to go about their hardships. Quote, if you can't handle it, don't watch it, end quote. Same thing. Parental guidance is a thing for a reason, even if y'all have been too good for it your entire lives, myself included. And so Damien, I, I think that's an interesting point, and I, I would say you, you can never really control how people consume your content. I have personally not watched through 13 Reasons Why. I've seen summaries, reviews from people that loved it and hated it. I think it's a tricky situation because what you're talking about is the, the girl in the show, she dies, she sends these tapes to all the people that, that failed to help her. And so from your point of view, this, this girl got everything she wanted because all the people that could have helped, all of a sudden they, there's an impact there. The other way to look at it would be this is a fictional story, a cautionary tale. If there was a fork in the road, this is the path you do not want. That said, how effectively the series portrays that, I don't know. Then let's jump into Thursday. Thursday we talked about whether the CNN Van Jones clip was misleading, Vancouver's most notorious bird, the woman who ran over a would-be thief, and the revised Trump travel ban going into effect. On the pregnant woman who tried to run over a potential thief with her car, Craze wrote, in what world is selectively running someone over with a car not attempted murder? Cars are moving death machines. Brad T wrote, that girl should be able to run him over and not get charged for anything. He fucking tried robbing her. If cops show up and run him over, it would be a nothing burger. Really? So we're just gonna start saying nothing burger all the time. Is that what we're deciding? It would be a nothing burger, but she is not allowed to defend herself the same way? Fucking bullshit. Alright, so Brad, this comes down to a, a basic old argument. If someone tries to rob you, but then they run away, they are no longer a threat. Should you be allowed to attack them when they are no longer a threat? Let's say cars equal guns for this argument. Most places say you are not authorized, that it is illegal to shoot someone in the back. But in some places like Texas, you can shoot someone running away from you trying to get away in the back legally. According to section 9.42 of the penal code, a person is justified in using deadly force against another to protect land or tangible movable property to prevent the other who is fleeing immediately after committing burglary, robbery, aggravated robbery, or theft during the nighttime from escaping with the property. And he reasonably believes that the land or property cannot be protected or recovered by any other means. But in general, in not Texas-like places, it's a no-no. Also, even in Texas, the circumstances we saw in the video, that would still not be protected. Still a no-no. I feel like it's very much us trying to separate ourselves from our inner caveman. Part of me has no remorse for a thief, a bad guy. But then the other part of me is like, I, I don't want to approve vigilante justice. Also, how she's only being charged with a misdemeanor, I have no idea. I kind of think they just don't want to go hard on her considering the circumstances. On the Van Jones CNN story, JD1060 writes, one video everyone is praising Phil for talking about the CNN Russian video scandal. Next, the same folks are calling Phil a shill for CNN when he presents the other side of the story that suggests the footage may push a narrative. I guess that's the price Phil pays for not paying attention to the bullshit agendas, whether they be from the left or the right. Well, I'll address this because we have a, a lot of new people that have joined the fam in the past month. Yes, this is something that is, of course, always annoying to me. One week, I'm a social justice warrior cuck. Next week, I'm a Nazi sympathizing right-wing monster. But the way I deal with it is knowing that a lot of those people aren't going to stick around. A lot of those people claim that they want something that's fair and balanced, but then you, you hit them with something that they don't like. And so the way a lot of people justify it is how they always justify it. They, they put the opposition, in that instance, me, in a box as this one-dimensional thing. But what's kind of interesting is that by focusing on this, I have no team angle. Trying to talk about the news and the world, not from just a left or a right angle, just, just talk about it. We've been kind of building our own team, our team of misfits that feel like maybe we didn't belong somewhere else. A team that acknowledges that a lot of people live in the black and the white, but we live in the gray. Or a bunch of people just watch me because their fetish is a, an unattractive, kind of overweight white guy talking about the news. Either way, it works for me. And I think that's actually where I'm gonna end today's show. And guys, I just wanted to thank you for another fantastic week. I truly mean it, whether you find yourself agreeing or disagreeing with me, just thank you for being a part of this. And with that said, of course, remember, if you liked this video, you like what I do on this channel, hit that like button if you're new here, hit that subscribe button. Also remember, this Sunday is very special. We have a sixth video this week, and that is the Casey Neistat podcast. It is gonna be a good one. That said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces, and I'll see you Sunday.